which stands for Educate, Empower, and Employ. Funding to support this project is provided by the Rehabilitation Services Administration. My name is Kate Anderson, and I work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My colleague Toby Parch-Davies from the University of New Hampshire, and I will be working together today to co-facilitate this discussion. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Toby Parch Davies, and I work at the University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability. Disability and poverty are two topics I'm very passionate about. As a former job developer and now a researcher and evaluator, I've worked for many years in an attempt to reduce economic disparity among workers with disabilities through the use of Social Security and Medicaid work incentives, individual development accounts, and household budgeting and credit repair. IRS tax credits, employment, and now ABLE accounts. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. The purpose of Project E3 is to provide technical assistance to state vocational rehabilitation agencies and their partners, addressing barriers to VR participation and competitive integrated employment of historically underserved groups of individuals with disabilities. These groups are defined as residents of rural and remote communities, adjudicated adults and youth, youth with disabilities in foster care, individuals with disabilities receiving federal financial assistance, specifically temporary assistance for needy families or TANF, culturally diverse populations, high school dropouts and functionally illiterate consumers, persons with multiple disabilities, and SSI and SSDI recipients and beneficiaries, including sub-minimum wage employees. So the outline for our discussion today involves a basic overview of disability and poverty, some definitions, also a, a brief look at the research. What is the current research telling us from behavioral economics and neuroscience? Social determinants of health. What does this mean and why is it important? The Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, WIOA and poverty, what do we need to know about this and how do these align? And finally, probably the most important piece is what can I do about this? How can I take action to integrate some of this information into my So let's start with some basic background on poverty and defining poverty. There are actually a number of definitions um, related to poverty ex in existence. However, we tend to use um, the what's well, referred to as the federal poverty level, uh, which is defined by the federal government. Um, it is updated annually and published in the federal register, typically mid to late January each year. So the figures you see in front of you right now are uh, represent the 2018, the 2018 uh, federal poverty guidelines. And this represents 100% of the federal poverty level or what, what people refer to as the poverty line. So as an example, in a family unit size one, so one individual in the household, in the family, uh, in the 48 contiguous states and the District of Columbia, this equates to $12,140 per year or $1,012 per month. Uh, the amount is higher in Alaska and Hawaii to account for the higher, uh, higher cost of living in those states. But when you look at that figure of $12,140 a year or a little over $1,000 a month, um, it's pretty clear to see that that is not a lot of money to live on. When you think of the expenses that most folks have, including rent or mortgage, so the housing expenses, uh, utilities, transportation, food, clothing, uh, et cetera. So in thinking about the individuals that you work with, what percentage would you estimate are living at or below the federal poverty level? So approximately what percentage of folks have income of about $1,000 a month or less if it's a household of one? It's actually kind of a humbling concept to think about. And when we, when we pose this question to groups of vocational rehabilitation professionals, rehabilitation counselors, typically the response that we get is that most professionals estimate that at least 90% of the individuals on their caseload are probably living at or below the federal poverty level. 
We've borrowed this infographic from our colleagues at the National Disability Institute. They do very nice work in the area of disability and poverty uh, as well. And they have extracted data that, uh, from, uh, from a variety of sources, but um, specifically the Census Bureau, and um, have developed this nice infographic to depict some of the disabilities and poverty statistics. So we know that adults with disabilities are twice as likely to live in poverty as those without a disability. We also know that women with disabilities are more likely to be living in poverty than men. The disparity in poverty rate between people with and without disabilities grows with age. We also know that uh, as educational levels increase among people with disabilities, the poverty rate declines. We also know that people of color with and without disabilities are more likely to be living in poverty than the non-Hispanic white population. Unfortunately, this is a stubborn statistic that has persisted over time, um, but it also illustrates uh, part of the under, underpinning and the reasoning um, behind a technical assistance center that is specifically focused on uh, targeted communities. Um, the goal, again, is to help, uh, help change some of this. Now, interestingly, when we look at the banking uh, behaviors of individuals with and without disabilities, but specifically today we'll be focusing here on people with disabilities, 46% of households that are headed by an adult with a disability were unbanked or underbanked in 2013, compared to 29% of households headed by an adult without a disability. So what does that mean? Unbanked is typically defined as individuals do not have a formal relationship with a financial institution. So that could be a bank, a credit card, uh, excuse me, a credit union, or another formal financial institution. Underbanked means that they may have a formal relationship with a financial institution, but are really underutilizing um, the various options uh, and financial options available to them. And that could involve credit, lack of credit, no credit, poor credit, etc. 18% of households headed by a working age person with a disability were unbanked, while 28% were underbanked. 47% of households headed by working age persons with a disability were significantly more likely to report using alternative financial services, such as payday lenders. And additionally, 47% of households headed by working age persons with a disability were significantly less likely to have a savings account compared to their counterparts without disabilities. So we're sharing some of this today. Um, we're not going to be doing a deep dive into financial empowerment. We'll have a discussion uh, on that issue in the near future through this TA Center. But we just wanted to present this information. Um, NDI has done a nice job, again, pulling it together into this infographic, and it fits very well with the discussion on disability and poverty. So as we noted earlier, defining uh, poverty can be a bit tricky. It is a complex construct, uh, but today we're breaking it out into two primary uh, definitions of poverty. So situational poverty occurs as a lack of resources due to a particular event. So specifically, uh, an in individual is injured or acquires a disability, develops a chronic illness, uh, experiences divorce, death of a family member or spouse or parent, etc. Situational poverty is really tied to a specific event uh, and, and or time frame. Generational poverty is defined as a lack of multiple resources for at least two generations. However, the patterns can emerge uh, and begin to surface much sooner if the family lives with others experiencing generational poverty, which is very common. So generational poverty, just think of that in terms of multi-generation poverty. Um, and again, many of you can probably think of folks that you work with and, and individuals on your caseload that are experiencing uh, multi-generation poverty. It's within the generational poverty that we start to see emergent disability. And emergent disability really comes from uh, the educational literature more so than 
the um, rehabilitation literature, but emergent disability is when children who are born into uh, families that are experiencing multi-generational poverty um, are, are at higher risk for developing disability themselves. Scarcity and stress. Scarcity is distracting. What is scarcity? Scarcity involves a lack of intention, time, money, oftentimes commingled. Um, these fit together in many cases. Uh, but scarcity, uh, managing very limited resources, actually requires increased attention and more self-control, which can lead to depletion. In other words, it can actually take more time and energy to manage fewer resources because you're trying to stretch that dollar farther. You're trying to uh, figure out how to take three buses or transfer twice to go pick up your child from school uh, and then bring that child to you know, a caregiver and then still get to your shift on time. It takes a lot to manage very few resources. And depletion um, is really the effect of having this, dealing with scarcity over time and longer term. Depletion is stressful in and of itself. So scarcity actually can increase the stress and add it is another stressor in and of itself. It's associated with poor decision making. Uh, and oftentimes you'll see this in, in practice as a focus on the current short term problem, um, not focused on longer term uh, you know, future issues uh, may avoid longer term planning, um, etc. And kind of a, what we would otherwise say kind of survival mode. So a very a, a focus on very short term um, uh, goals or or needs. So now shifting into some of the contemporary research in this area, we're talking about disability and poverty. Uh, it's really interesting to look at the behavioral economics research. And I'm not sure many of you might be familiar with this body of, of literature, but it's a relatively new field uh, and really blends the fields of uh, psychology and economics um, to help study, learn, and explain decision-making and uh, specifically financial decision-making. So we have a link here to uh, a study that was published not long ago, and it's uh, a pretty easy read. It, it's interesting. It's in Harvard Magazine. Um, but essentially, two, two researchers, um, an economist at Harvard and a psychologist at Princeton, decided to collaborate. And they pulled together years of findings from the fields of psychology and economics and added their own empirical research to this. And the analysis that they were looking at, um, or the research questions that they had, is that they wanted to learn if scarcity, so again, scarcity, that lack of resources, um, if scarcity steals mental capacity. Um, and again, whether that is a, you're poor, you have a lack of income, uh, you're hungry, lack of food, lonely, uh, lack of social connections, or time strapped, or all of the above. So what did they find? The researchers found that poverty depletes cognitive resources, therefore leaving little space for making everyday decisions around parenting, school, work, etc. In other words, it takes more time and energy to manage fewer resources. They also found impulsive behavior, poor performance in school, and what presents as poor financial decision making may actually be products of a feeling of scarcity. They noted that just thinking about scarcity taxes the mind and increases stress. Low-income parents are also at far greater risk for depression and anxiety, which is also discussed as poverty's mental tax. They noted that when parents are distracted or depressed, family life may be characterized by conflict and emotional withdrawal rather than nurturing and supportive relationships with their children. And finally, and this might be the most interesting piece, finally, um, they noted that policy, policies and programs need to consider scarcity-induced behavior in their design. So our programs traditionally focus on the individual, so the pilot, um, and they are suggesting that instead of putting the onus on the pilot, 
Perhaps our systems and programs need to look at redesigning our cockpit or the systems designed to serve, serve these individuals to help improve some of the outcomes. So some additional research that's interesting to look at is uh, in the field of neuroscience. And again, another study that was published not long ago, and, and this is widely available. You can even find clips on YouTube if you'd like a, a quick version of this or to hear the information from the, from the researchers themselves uh, directly. But um, two neuroscience scientists, one at Columbia University and one at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, collaborated. And they imaged the brains of 1,099 children, adolescents, and young adults in several cities across the United States. They controlled for genetic ancestry uh, and some other factors in order to isolate the effects of poverty. So what they were really looking for uh, was to, to focus in on poverty itself and the, po the effect of poverty um, on the brains of these children, adolescents, and young adults, and whether or not there was, there was a difference. So what did they find? They found that family income is significantly correlated with children's brain size. They also found that income disparities of a few thousand dollars were associated with major differences in brain structure, specifically language and decision-making skills. Test scores measuring cognitive skills such as reading and memory ability also declined as parental income declined. And interestingly, and this is the point that I think is, is actually the most exciting, increases in income were associated with the greatest increases in brain surface among the poorest children. And specifically, they found that increases uh, in household income of about $4,000 uh, in households that predominantly had overall annual household income of $25,000 or less, if they could increase that household income by about $4,000, there were significant uh, brain, positive brain changes um, subsequently recorded uh, with those children. So what does that mean? I think I put on my vocational rehabilitation hat for a moment and think about this as a rehabilitation counselor. Our public VR programs are perfectly situated to help these individuals and families. We know employment. We know how to help people find employment, how to keep employment, uh, how to grow their careers, et cetera. We can help with this. So if you are a rehabilitation counselor or someone working with individuals with disabilities and employment, consider yourself part of the potential solution and part of the, um, the promise with this particular area. Additionally, there's further research documenting uh, the relationship between financial stress um, and its association with poor health. We also know that mental health and debt are associated. Um, as we discussed earlier uh, with the construct of emergent disability, um, hardship experiences themselves uh, can lead to poor health and disability. Um, and sometimes what we refer to as secondary health conditions. So as an example, um, something that may be very, uh, a condition that may be very treatable, um, but if an individual does not have access to proper treatment or health, uh, health care or health coverage, um, the treatable condition could then become a disability itself. So essentially a secondary health condition is um, a, a treatable condition that if left untreated can result in a disability or become a disability. Um, and then we certainly know that the relationship between poverty, disability, and health is often cyclical. Um, and we tend to see this uh, pretty prevalently with um, the generational or multi-generational poverty. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Parch Davies, and she'll tell us a little bit more about the social determinants of health. Social determinants such as economic or political conditions that characterize individuals and communities also play a role in poverty and the persistence of poverty. Income in inequality, local economies, educational status, quality of housing supply, and public infrastructure such as access or lack of access to transportation systems, technology, 
food stores, banking products, personal care, and self-advocacy supports needed to exercise rights and control over livelihoods are some examples. The geographical makeup of community and its culture is also very important. Rural, urban, and suburban centers have their own unique challenges. In these cases, again, what is the infrastructure available to persons with disabilities? What are the social attitudes about people with disabilities and or culture, ethnic, or linguistic minorities? All of these factors interact and affect financial security, socioeconomic status, and health and necessitate not only as a counselor helping to address individual barriers to employment, but also necessitate vocational rehabilitation systems to address community level structural impediments to opportunity in local communities. So why do rehabilitation counselors and other professionals need to understand the disability and poverty connection? First, we need to develop a better understanding of the intersection between disability and poverty. And we use that term very intentionally, intersection, um, referring to social justice, intersectionality, but understanding that disability and poverty uh, can be deeply interwoven. Uh, you know, based on our earlier, earlier part of the discussion, we know that individuals with disabilities are less likely to be employed and are more li likely to live in poverty than any other demographic group. We also know that individuals with disabilities are disproportionately representative, uh, represented in higher numbers um, among those who are living at or below the federal poverty level. We also need to be aware of this, uh, the connection between disability and poverty um, to improve our cultural competence. And despite the fact that almost two thirds of adults living in long-term poverty have disabilities, poverty and disability have historically been treated as separate issues addressed by separate advocacy groups and separate governmental programs. However, the reality is that disability and poverty work to reinforce one another and perpetuate inequities and inequalities across systems. So um, we really do need to understand this from a, a cultural competence um, perspective and what we were talking about with some of the behavioral economics, um, you know, in, in, in terms of redesigning uh, some of the programs or rethinking uh, and redesigning some of the, the programs that we, we work in, um, considering those the cockpit. We need to understand this connection um, in terms of the implications for service delivery, and I think that ties to the, to the previous point pretty well. Also, uh, we cannot have discussion around poverty or addressing poverty issues without actively talking about employment and financial empowerment. So employment, again, public vocational rehabilitation uh, professionals are experts at employment. Um, financial empowerment, uh, we'll have, as I mentioned before, we'll have another discussion around financial empowerment. Um, but financial empowerment is another key piece of the puzzle. Um, you get a paycheck, but what do you do with the paycheck? Um, how do we, how do we help, um, help folks build strategies and some planning, planning tools in a culturally appropriate way that also recognizes uh, multi-generational poverty issues and realities? And also, of course, we need to understand current policy and public benefit programs in order to best serve the individuals that we work with. WIOA and poverty. So the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014, WIOA, focuses specifically on serving younger individuals, uh, which is important. As we talked about earlier, um, the concept and construct of emergent disability um, is, re is really key. And I think this is where WIOA, it's taken some structural change and, and, and a considerable amount of work within our state programs um, to make adjustments to better, better serve uh, younger individuals, those that are eligible for VR services and those that are potentially eligible for services. But really, consider it a sound investment. If we can work with individuals with disabilities starting at younger ages, uh, and specifically those that are also experiencing poverty or living in multi-generational poverty households, uh, we have an opportunity at early intervention um, to help change the trajectory uh, of those lives. WIOA 
uh, also places an increased uh, responsibility on VR programs to engage and employ uh, or successfully employ uh, individuals representing the historically underserved populations. And with this, for a minute, I want you to think about the RSA 911 data elements. So the data that we gather and input on each of the, with each of the individuals that we serve in our programs. The number of data elements about doubled uh, with the advent of WIOA, which I know uh, was considered to be a burden by many, and, and I don't want to um, downplay this because I know it does take a lot of additional work. But when you take a moment and look at the data elements itself and some of the additional data elements, they really hone in on the poverty factors. Um, and some of what we were discussing earlier today in terms of the demographics um, and who is represented uh, or disproportionately represented um, among those that are living at or below the federal poverty level. If you look at, think about that and then look at the 9-11 data elements, you will see a lot of alignment there. So those are really important to, to take seriously and report on accurately. Under WIOA, we're now taking a longer term uh, look at employment and earnings outcomes. Historically, we had the 90 day closures and now we, we need to look at employment and earnings outcomes um, at, at quarter two and quarter four, um, which is also represents um, a commitment to, to looking at employment as a longer term commitment. Uh, with the individuals that we serve. Because we know that if we get somebody employed at 90 days and boom, they lose their job, there's really not much of a chance that that person is going to be increasing their overall um, annual income. So I think that that longer term look is, is, is important. And also finally, that collaboration with other programs um, also serving low income individuals with disabilities. Now within the public VR program, everyone that we serve, everyone who's determined eligible uh, does have a disability. Um, we know that many of the other partner programs also have high incidence of disability, but they may or may not um, have the knowledge, expertise uh, to, to appropriately serve um, some of these individuals. So I think the collaboration piece is gonna be key, not just in terms of VR, assisting partners, um, but partners who may be working with uh, individuals that also represent these underserved populations that could benefit from VR services. So what can I do? As rehabilitation professionals, um, it, we, we just provided a lot of information across a variety of different um, aspects of disability and poverty. So what do you do with this? Um, and how can you take this and, and put it into practice? I think the first, the first point is probably um, pretty simple, but we simply encourage individuals with disabilities to consider employment. Vocational rehabilitation is an employment program, and we really can't have discussions about disability and poverty without employment being at the heart of those discussions. So again, encouraging folks to consider employment. You can also share information about your state's vocational rehabilitation program. Um, you know, the, the myth persists that we, we are the best kept secret and we shouldn't be. Um, there's no reason for VR to be a secret. Um, actively and openly share information about your state's program. Make sure you have a good website um, that is, you know, clean and accessible. Um, your literature is clean and, and um, easily available to those who want it. For state program staff, you know, we encourage you to review your application process um, and to determine whether information about your program is easy to find. Um, do you have an online application process? Um, is it, uh, can, can people apply over the phone? How, how accessible is your application process and how easy is it to find that information? Is the information about your program clear? Again, about VR being an employment program. Um, you want this point to be very, to be crystal clear in all of your materials, your messaging, um, conversations, etc. Um, I know that over the years, you know, we tend to have folks that that apply, um, thinking that we are the place to come to get a vehicle or college education paid for, and it's not to say that we can't do that, um, but it all needs to be 
tied to a clear employment goal um, with clear outcomes because we are an employment program. Are our materials uh, clear, transparent? Um, do we have timely application and eligibility processes? We know that folks tend to drop off between application and eligibility determination if it's not done quickly enough. Um, the 60-day window really shouldn't be the norm. That's really the outer, <laughs> outer window on how long it should take. <clears throat> Most of the time, el eligibility determination should take uh, much shorter than that. And also, um, our VR program, is it known and understood by colleagues in related areas that also serve uh, individuals with disabilities who may be living at or below the federal poverty level? Colleagues in our schools, um, TANF programs, um, et cetera. It's important for these folks to have a basic understanding of the public VR program, um, how to assist individuals in applying, et cetera. So if, uh, if you feel like colleagues in some of these programs are not familiar with VR, um, we encourage you to reach out and um, you know, develop a, a basic presentation. Honestly, even an elevator speech can be helpful with a few bullet points about what is VR, how do people find your information, um, etc. And finally, if you found this uh, discussion today to be helpful or interesting and you'd like to continue the discussion and or access uh, some of the resources that we, we referenced here, we encourage you to join our online community of practice. Uh, it's an opportunity to discuss, learn, share resources with colleagues from around the country. And um, we will be continuing to, um, there's a number of resources currently available in the COP, but it's a great forum to be able to take this discussion and continue it online. Thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to continuing the discussion with you in the online community of practice and uh, look forward to chatting with you there. Thanks. Great, thanks Kate and Toby. We now will do the question and answer, answer part of the webinar. And my colleague, Heidi Decker Maurer, will take over that aspect. And again, I think we've had one question. We also have some, there's a number of other, and we have some other questions as well. But feel free as Toby and Kate are answering the questions, if something occurs to you, to put a, an additional question in the Q&A box. So, uh, take it away, Heidi. Well, thank you so much, Kate and Toby, for that great presentation. We really appreciate the information that was sent along. Um, we're really glad to have all of the attendees participating in today's webinar, and we're so glad that you're able to join us and that you have some good questions for us. So I'll start with a question that was sent to me beforehand, actually. Um, this question... Um, the person said, I've found that a lot of parents and guardians don't want their children to earn income because they're afraid they might lose their benefits or that the hours jobs are available, don't work with the family schedule, and they just don't accommodate things. Um, Kate or Toby, do you have, have any um, thoughts about that? Sure. This is Toby. I can um, respond to that. And I'm a caregiver myself. My daughter has an intellectual disability and accesses a lot of the community support systems, in particular vocational rehabilitation and Medicaid. So I'm actually, you know, living that experience right now. And <clears throat> my response to it is that, you know, we're often looking as service providers or VR counselors at, at the individual situation, um, the individual customer. And as we all understand on the call, um, you know, families tend to live together. Um, so the extent to which resources and tangible resources impact family resiliency, um, and uh, as Kate shared information about stress, um, navigating all those systems is another form of hassle. Um, and I mean that as an actual term in the literature of um, behavioral economics, they're, they're referred to as hassles. All of that is more taxing. So um, it's a very nuanced situation. It's not as simple as I don't want my child to work. Most parents 
want the best for their kids and they want them to work. The issue is, is that it, it poses a challenge for balancing schedules, balancing the navigation of the public benefit system, and carving out time in, in you know, daily and weekly and monthly schedules to do that administrative um, work that's required um, to keep things stable in family life. Thanks, Toby. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Kate, did you have anything else to add or should I move on to the next question? No, I think Toby did a great job um, answering that. Thank you. And um, by the way, I think Toby's name shows up next to my picture as well. And um, I think that's great. Everyone needs an alias, right? So Toby, you're now going to be my alias. Excellent. I'll, I'll take you, I'll assume your picture anytime. You're beautiful. Oh, the wonders of technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think we'll move along to the next question. Um, we have one that says, if a parent is highly educated but chooses a very low-paying job, is there a, still a negative impact on youth brains? And Kate, I know you addressed the, um, the as little as $4,000 making a difference, but um, how, how does this question fit in with that? Yeah, thank you. Great question, uh, Sarah. And, you know, I honestly, I don't know. Um, but we could certainly go back into the studies um, and, and look at that. I think they were primarily looking at um, specifically the um, uh, total income level. Um, and I don't know if they broke it out into, let's say, parental um, educational level as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I honestly don't know if there's, there would still be that negative impact um, on youth brains. But, um, but we can certainly follow up. We can look at that and uh, share that information through the COP. Good question. Yeah, and I, I would just add that, um, you know, protective factor framework, some of you may be familiar with um, that framework on the call, which helps build family resiliency. Um, and one of the protective factors is referred to as tangible resources, meaning financial resources. So if a parent by choice decides to accept a lower income job, I mean, we definitely have to go back to the research to see what, what evidence is there to help answer that question. But I would, I would think um, that, you know, the parent's resiliency and some of those other resources, those tangible resources or family support or, um, you know, the, the social capital that that family may have access to would impact, you know, whether or not the environment was such um, to, you know, challenge, you know, put cognitive challenges as a result of that environment on the youth's brain. That, that's what I would, I would hypothesize. Great, Toby. Thank you for answering that. Sarah, if you would like to um, chat me um, to let me know if you have any more questions about that, please let me know. We have your email on, on, on file with the registration, and we can certainly have it answered in a little bit more depth if you'd like. Um, just go ahead and let me know in uh, one of the private chats. So um, I think we'll move on to one of our next questions that we had from before. Um, the question is, what can we do to reduce the burden so that customers and families access the resources that we have to offer? Kate or Toby, do either one of you, um, who would like to tackle it? That's a great question. Um, and, and in so many ways, in so many reasons why we're here today, um, <clears throat> because, you know, families and customers navigate multiple systems, right? So from the standpoint of, of planning to really get at this persistent obstacle of poverty, both at the individual level, the, the customer level, but also um, in of place, right? Um, in the, in the actual regional locations that you're working in. And um, from my standpoint, you know, I, what I would say is working with your um, your community partners to figure out how can you plan um, services in such a way that reduces that burden. So what can you do to help expedite, you know, the intake process um, and to um, take as many of those hassles out of the process while still addressing your congressional um, or regulatory requirements. Um, but if the goal is to recruit more people, retain more clients, result in 
um, you know, better milestones um, uh, and outcomes for youth, youth and adults, um, doing whatever you can to, to really prioritize what do you absolutely have to do versus, versus what's an administrative procedure that could be changed in such a way it's more user-friendly to the client and the family. And I know Kate has some examples of that. Um, yes, Dr. Does Kate have examples off the top of her head? I'm not sure. <laughs> But, <laughs> um, but yes, no, totally everything that you were sharing is, is spot on. And, and, and I think just, um, again, often unintentionally, the systems that many of us work in, um, you know, create some of the barriers um, uh, unintentionally, just through some of the administrative procedure. And, and honestly, um, sometimes just due to, uh, you know, sheer numbers and or staffing imbalance or... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even when we had shared that, uh, how can we take action in encouraging folks to learn more about VR and to better understand the program, I still think that's wonderful and definitely needed. Um, but we also certainly know that some of the realities right now, um, mm -hmm. that many of the state VR programs are either in an order of selection um, or moving into an order of selection, and that can create some um, some unintentional barriers too and nobody really wants those but it, it's really a resource issue so mm -hmm. um i think anything the first step is really awareness right and that we have kind of a common understanding and awareness of some of this um but then also just making sure that we're um, cognizant about um acknowledging that uh, and that could be a frustration for some of the the folks that really want our services or would like to access services mm -hmm. and we may just not be able simply may not be able to serve them as as quickly as we would like to so mm -hmm. um always though giving ourselves that uh, that opportunity for continuous uh, quality improvement right mm -hmm. and i just thought of a, a good example of, of something that could be done and having just gone through this myself with my daughter um and I know and have known for many years about <clears throat> Social Security and Medicaid work incentives and have done a lot of research in that area um, and practice in that area. And one of the things, if, if, if I were to, you know, suggest a system improvement that would be really great and help reduce a hassle, it would be um, when, you know, a person is offered a position and hopefully they've had benefits planning and work incentives counseling, you know, prior to that, that job offer. Um, but when they notify their counselor that they were offered a job, having that counselor or benefits planner be um, very timely and saying, okay, now this is what's going to happen. Within 10 days, you have to report. Here's a simple form you can use. Report your income to Social Security. And every month, you know, over the next, you know, every, at the end of every month, you need to report your income. And, and as many of you know, um, you know, retail positions, the hours can fluctuate a lot. And so every time those hours fluctuate each month, there's a new letter that comes from Social Security to say that your SSI amount is changing. So coming up with a user-friendly system of, you know, packaging payroll stubs, and just like a suggested toolkit would be really user friendly for families and workers to try to, you know, learn how to do that process and consistently report every month so that they don't get in a situation of an overpayment or, you know, they're not, um, you know, short resources and when they really should have more resources. Toby, that, that's excellent. Um, it's really hard for anyone to, to juggle life and when you have some more of those barriers to engagement that make it a little bit more difficult to, to reach the things that you need for your family to thrive, um, that really can, can be a big problem. Um, thank you so much for the answer. I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next question. Um, I believe the next one we have is, has any research been done on outliers of the general population of the study? And what the, what the questioner meant um, is the persons with higher brain size yet still in poverty. So did I, I hope I asked that question correctly. Yeah, 
and this is Kate. Um, you know, again, another excellent question. And um, I wasn't looking at that specifically in the research. So I would want to go back to the study, um, the studies that we noted here to, to ensure that I'm uh, of course, accurately, you know, um, uh, sharing the information um, coming from the studies. But I believe we have the links to the studies in the presentation. If we don't, we can certainly send those out or, or load those into the COP. Um, and folks are welcome to look at the information um, directly. Um, I think specifically the uh, the nice thing too, actually, with the the cognitive uh, neuroscience um, in, in that particular study is that they have some YouTube videos um, that have been uh, made available online as well. Um, and I think they may have podcasts as well. So if you're interested in both the behavioral economics um, research that we that we cited as well as the cognitive neuroscience, they have some very user-friendly uh, resources out there. And so we're certainly happy to send those along. But going back to your question, um, I'm not sure, but uh, we can certainly go back and revisit the studies and share some of that information in the COP. Thank you so much, Kate. And um, I've got good news for all of our folks asking questions. If we're not able to get to the questions during our time provided here, um, all the questions will be answered and available and posted in the community of practice that we put together around E3 and around a lot of these issues. So I do have a few more in the queue here, and I think we have time maybe for one more question. Um, and I think, Terry, it's about seven or eight minutes left before we wrap up. Okay, um, I think the final question we'll take for today um, is as a VR program, how do we know many of our consumers are living in poverty? Sure, well, this is Kate. I'll, I'll feel this and then Toby, feel free to jump in. Sure. Um, you know, in my experience in, in working with uh, the 9-11 data, which if you're not familiar with the 9-11 data, that's, it's really the, uh, the data that um, state VR counselors, staff and, and programs are required to input um, for each, consumer um, in the in the program and then also it's used to then um, report out an aggregate um, in the quarterly uh, reports to the Rehabilitation Services Administration but the clearest poverty indicator in the 9-11 data um, really is the receipt of supplemental security income SSI benefits there are a number of different uh, variables within the data that you could look at, but I think if, if as a VR program, you really wanna get a pulse on um, how many of your consumers uh, are, are living in poverty, I would look at, run your data and look and see um, the number and percentage of individuals that are receiving SSI benefits. Um, and that could be at different points in time. So that could be at application. Uh, to the program that could be a plan development that could also be an exit. Um, uh, be, just given that SSI is a means based program, it, it does mean that an individual and household um, has to meet has very limited income and assets and must meet those asset limitations in order to to qualify for the program. So Toby, is there anything else that you can think of that would be um, a way for a VR program to kind of get a pulse on how many um, how many of their consumers are living in poverty? Yeah, I think that would probably be the, the most expedited way. Um, you know, other ways, other indicators might be access to um, subsidized housing. I'm not, I, I don't work for a VR agency. I don't, I'm not sure if that's captured in um, the 9-11, the new updated 9-11 data. Um, but I think the, it's really the SSI indicator um, for sure. For data that's, you know, readily available to you, certainly. It's easy to take myself off mute and put myself right back on mute again. Um, <laughs> it looks like we have about one time for one more question. So um, I think we'll go um, with, is the Ticket to Work program the same in all states or does it differ? And if it does differ, then how so? Okay, well, I'm happy to jump in on this, and then Toby, again, feel free to feel free to chime in. Um, technically, the Ticket to Work program, I mean, it's a national program, and so the framework, um, the design 
uh, should be consistent across all states. However, I think where it differs um, is when it gets into, you know, a component of the Ticket to Work is the employment networks, um, and then also the, um, uh, the WIPA, the Work Incentive uh, Planning and Assistance Program is also funded under the same legislation. And so um, I think just access to the resources may differ either geographically or within states um, in terms of how the ticket is actually operationalized um, uh, in terms of the number of employment networks available, um, whether or not, you know, they're kind of equally distributed in, in all areas of a state. Um, I think that's where it differs. But technically, the framework, it's a national program, so it, it on paper, it, it, it should be um, similar in all states, but I think in terms of the local resources um, available to to help with the employment services, that might be that that in all likelihood does differ from state mm -hmm. to state. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. Yeah, and I I like the last question. We and we probably don't have um, much time to respond. And Heidi, just cut me off if you'd rather we not dive into it. But we're dealing we're dealing with this uh, you know very low unemployment rates in New Hampshire, and I know other states are key industries. Um, do I have time to respond to that? Or I no? think we should. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Please do it, Toby. Right. Thank you. All right. Sure. So the question is from Anne. In your research, what have you found to be the relationship between low unemployment rates, corporate perception of liability, and specific disabilities? Um, I've been doing this sort of work for um, close to 30 years in some capacity, um, which is hard to believe. But um, you know, I found that when there's um, low unemployment and jobs are plentiful, it's oftentimes harder to access employment opportunities for people with significant disabilities because, and this is only anecdotal, this isn't research-based, um, but the workforce is often um, struggling to retain its own workers. Um, to, to support people with significant disabilities and employment. So I don't know if other counselors or CRPs on the call, you know, have that experience too, that, you know, when jobs are plentiful, maybe, maybe their workforce isn't as stable, but that's certainly in my experience what I've, what I've observed. Um, and there have been references made in meetings where there's so many jobs out there, people should just, you know, be able to get a job. Anyone can get a job, but, but some of those jobs, because, because, the, the dynamics of people starting and ending and, you know, the turnover isn't always the best from the standpoint of, um, you know, managerial rapport or training or what have you. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Kate, but that, that's certainly been my observation over the years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, in terms of um, the relationship between low unemployment rates, corporate perception of liability, specific disabilities, um, you know, interestingly, and I'm not going to cite specific research on this, but I think we have seen it consistently in the literature, um, as well as some of our own research where, um, it, you know, with, it, in terms of specific disability, unfortunately, that mental health stigma still persists. And that's something that we are actively um, working with employers to better understand um, so that, um, you know, as rehabilitation counselors and researchers, we have more tools in our toolkit um, to better understand employer needs and then be able to help uh, dispel some of the myth, <laughs> myth and lore mm -hmm. that may persist around certain disability types or disability labels. Mm. It'd be great if there could be like a rapid, a rapid response um, because so many employers I know in our state are just can't hire enough help. They just have such a, a need for workers um, and it would be awesome if VR and communities could come together and, you know, develop some sort of rapid response and make sure that your customers are part of that workforce response, um, but have a very targeted, you know, and very, you know, meeting the employer need, but obviously the, the, the employment goal of the customer as well. That was, that was wonderful. Um, Toby and Kate, that, that's a great discussion. Um, and it, um, it also sounds like something that might be a really good topic for uh, the community of practice that E3 has up and running. Um, Terry is displaying some information in a few minutes about the community of practice. Um, we put this together um, for the needs of 
practitioners, uh, folks who are in the field, boots on the ground, working um, to help people with disabilities, um, especially who have more challenging circumstances, to be able to chat with one another, find out what's working for, um, for people in different states, what they've tried and maybe want to share or learn a little bit more about. With the community of practice, it's something that we've put together as a technical assistance, just generally for anybody in the field. Um, we will be housing all the recordings of all of our webinars on the community of practice um, so people can access the PowerPoints, um, the, the video that will be captioned. Um, there are also spaces to have conversations. So there are little chat rooms um, where where folks can get together and um, have a discussion about whatever it is that you would really like to talk about. We do have a, a discussion group coming up. Um, we're scheduling a discussion group as a follow-up for this webinar so that folks can get together um, and talk about it. Um, we'd really love to have you join us at the community of practice. The more folks that we have and the more, um, the more points of view, expertises, different regions, the more robust this community will be, and it will be great for serving your needs, um, you know, through peer network and through, you know, helping one another. Um, we'll have experts on sometimes, um, but really we want it to suit the needs of, um, of the people who are interested in the topics that we're working on. Um, I believe Terry is sharing the screen on how to get to the community of practice. Again, it's free. There's, there's no cost. Um, there are a lot of good resources that are, are stored there in terms of files and videos, um, and we'd really love to have you join us. Um, I believe we'll have a few people still on the line for a little while afterwards, and if you'd like to uh, have a little help or a tour of the community of practice, we'll be available for probably about another half an hour. Um, but I think that at this point, this concludes the, the formal part of our, of our webinar today. Um, Terry, was there anything that you had to add? The only piece I will add to repeat what Heidi talked about is we will work with Kate and Toby to answer the questions that we didn't get to in the question and answer period, and we will be posting those on the community of practice site. Also, just a reminder that if you Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We will be having another webinar uh, January 29th.